Karen, my initial thought on this episode was it was very different for the following reason. It was much more visual. And obviously, or I assume it was filmed in St. Pat's Cathedral in New York City. But so that in and of itself made it interesting. But the this could not have been on the radio because you couldn't have seen the faces. Mm, awesome. And I absolutely love the facial shots and coming so close after the coronation of King Charles III, when they put the camera on Harry, I was just really intrigued by the visual nonverbal part of this show. Mm -hmm. And that was, I know that's not part of the storyline or the story block, but that was my first reaction. What were your initial thoughts about this episode? No, it's exactly right. And it's a good analogy to the coronation because it was similar in that you're in this huge church. It is such a huge sort of visually stunning episode with how big it is, how many people are there the side of the coffin coming up, looking nearly like a Pope with how adorned it is. And so you couldn't have translated that, you're right, without those visual, without seeing that on screen. I thought it was, I thought it was one of their best, I think in the long history of great franchises HBO has put out. The penultimate episode always is the one that stands out. Succession did itself no favors by having the third episode of the season be really the game changer and one of the best episodes I've seen to date. But this one was a really close second, I think. And a lot of people would argue this was the best they've seen out of all four seasons. I do think the acting was impeccable. It was, again, just another master class by these superbly talented people they've cast in the show. And Ewan, the brother, also was great. I want to say James Cameron, but I realize that's not who that is. James Crom Cromwell. Cromwell. I knew Adam, so I'm like, he didn't direct. The yeah, it, all of them. Spectacular. It was, a, it was an excellent hour and 15 or so of television. It was a long episode. What started off literally with a bang, the opening scene with Roman, I called it preening and prancing around his apartment with a walk-in closet to absolutely die for in New York City or Kerrville, Texas. And although I hang my clothes, I'm finally been able to learn to do that. Every sweater was folded. Everything was just color-coordinated, color-coded. It was like something I still strive to achieve. But he practicing the eulogy in front of the floor-length mirror or full-length mirror was just fabulous. A few ad libs here and there. And then the view from his apartment over the Hudson. Unbelievable. I thought that too. It almost was distracting because it was so spectacular. But yeah, Roman is just really, I think, one of the saddest stories of this episode. And really maybe the whole season, the whole series, given how this one transpired. And they set you up for it in the beginning of he's walking around making wild claims and even his ad libbing on his eulogy is very self aggrandizing. And then it all comes so crashing down in such an unbelievably poignant way. But yeah, that was, I think we probably knew based on that first scene that where this was probably going. <laughs> and then Kendall confronts his ex wife yeah. who is taking the kids to upstate New York because of the violence or threatened violence in New York City because of largely ATN calling the presidential race for Mencken. And that was one of the most gut-wrenching, ugliest scenes. I know we're both divorced, so I know we've gone through some of that. And that was just every time now we see them together, it gets worse and worse. And at one point, I thought he was going to hit her when she was outside the car and the kids were locked in. Before he said, you're going to have to run me over, which of course that wasn't going to happen. And I thought she was going to scream for the police and he was going to get arrested or something. But that was just horrible. And for me, though, it's it started off or once again accelerated what I see is the his mental degeneration. And he's just falling apart piece mm -hmm. by piece. And I just think he's headed for what happened to Roman in this episode at some point. It's interesting. I thought that was a really hard scene to watch. I thought he was going to pull the kids out of the car or something that would have been equally just makes you squeamish. I did appreciate 
that the arc somewhat that I think we'll get to, which is how what Shiv acknowledges how Roman handles his relationships with women and how there is this parallel because you have both his wife and then Jess, his assistant, in back to back scenes, this pile on him of adding to all of his stress about the day. But it shows he's always a bit of a bully, but how those are his two pre- fairly close relationships, both of whom are leaving him or trying to get away. Both of these are, I think, related to Mencken. So it's a bit of maybe even a, a conscience to him of recognizing this is not going to be good. But uh, yeah, that was a really hard scene. And I kudos to both that actress and then that, however, the, how they wrote that to have her really hold fast about we're leaving. No, the kids are not going to their grandfather's funeral, not just their grandfather, like Logan Roy's funeral. That's a big deal. I was wondering if she would cave or what was going to happen there. So yeah, that was a hard scene. At first, I thought he was going to hit her, but then when he didn't and he tried to get the door open and thank God it was a security car that was locked, my fear was he was going to grab the, one or both of the kids and yank them like Logan did, which mm-hmm. led to the original split and hurt the particularly the daughter. But fortunately, that didn't happen. But the meltdown with Jess, so Jess has put time on his calendar <laughs> to talk to him about her departure, which of course she's one of the very few African-Americans and certainly one of the few with a prominent role in the series. And she is very uncomfortable with the direction ATN, I guess she's with Waystar, is going and she wants out and uh, he does not take that well. No, he's so petulant. But you have to remark that it's amazing she's made it this long. I think she's been in the entire four seasons. I might be wrong about that, but She really has stuck it out through even worse things vis-a-vis Kendall, not probably vis-a-vis the state of the nation at that point. That is somewhat attributable to ATN. But this is finally it. This is enough. And so he tries to belittle her and calls her, I think, juvenile or something, and then does exactly what she knew he would do, which is to get mad at her that she, he told her, or that she told him on that day when she had said, I I don't want to tell you right now. (laughs) So it was, yeah, it just, it seemed so infantilized. All of it just was just petty. Then we get to the, to the cathedral and we have some just glorious shots of them walking around the cathedral and talking to some of the people who were wandering in, but it was just beautifully done. I felt like I was in the middle of a documentary on St. Pat's and and then Greg shows up to say, Tom won't be coming. Uh, and can I take his slot as a casket pusher? And that whole scene, that was just hilarious. I really didn't appreciate what an important role pushing a casket is. And the, but that, the scene that I thought certainly took this episode away and may have taken away the series was the WAGs. <laughs> wives and girlfriends. I just, I absolutely love that. Kendall and Shiv's, and I guess Roman's mother, the English Baroness. First of all, she has some fairly ugly things to say to her daughter about being pregnant. And then that, I don't know where she, I still don't know where she got that husband. I know. What a piece of work he is. But he go, she goes to her credit and gets Carrie and pulls Carrie up. It says, come sit with the family. And then he gets, she gets, I think, a woman named Sherry Ann. Sally Ann, maybe. Sally Ann. And Sally Ann was the first wife's Carrie. So we have first wife, first mistress, current wife, and current mistress. Uh, although we have to acknowledge the first wife is actually Connor's mother, and we don't know where she is right now. She's the one that he had. All right, for a minute. Wise. Yeah, yeah. But... They all go sit directly behind the family in a clear place of honor. And first of all, to see them there together, I can't remember if Shiv's or someone says Logan's head must be splitting. (laughs) But Marsha puts her hand over Carrie's hand. And I thought that was one of the most poignant gestures I have seen. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Carrie bursts into tears. But I just thought that encapsulated Logan Roy the best and the worst. And uh, later on, someone said he, maybe it was Shiv, said he couldn't handle the, his head couldn't handle women or, or mm-hmm. some, it was a pretty good line, but the scene of those four and when the facial expression started, 
it started for me with them. Yeah. So what did you think about all that? That was amazing. At first, I didn't believe it. But then I realized you know, Marsha, when she was so mean to Carrie right up after he died, she still had a not just an axe grind, but she had an angle. Like she needed to get to be seen as the wife to get the money. I think she did have, she had to be clear that she is the wife. And it is interesting to think that in what is probably a fairly quick amount of time, the writers had softened her character on that so that she was still able to be gracious and just realistic about how, what the relationship was with Carrie as well. I read somewhere that Sally Ann, the actress who played her, is actually Brian Cox's wife. So that was like a little trivia, <laughs> apparently, about the, that episode. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she got to sneak in. Yeah. So that was it. Was really impressive to see that. I, I, I took a beat because I didn't know how believable it was, but it, but then I thought that actually is really it's it is a nice sort of coda for this arc of that story. Now we skipped over when Shiv and her two brothers are traveling to the funeral and Shiv makes the big announcement and whatever you may or may not think of Roman. I thought he stooped to some of his lowest dialogue at one point when she first announces she's pregnant. He says, is it mine? Which I think the entire American population did a collective creep out just thinking about that. Then he says, if you breastfeed, I'll perform a sex act in front of you. Although he didn't use the word sex act which I thought was equally in poor taste. And Kendall has to bring him back down to earth. And once again, it was almost, she's, oh yeah, I'm pregnant. And they're like, oh, okay, great. Just nothing, li literally nothing. And I don't know if she, that was intentional for it to be no big deal, but given the, how many episodes it led up to, and certainly when she finally told Tom, it, it really was deflating for him. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it, there's, it was telling in what she said to Matt and when he realized it, and she said something like, I'll have a vanity C-section and never see the kid, or something that, I do wonder if that's some of the reality they haven't lived through, and so maybe they thought, maybe it isn't a big deal, you just had this kid, and then you keep going on running one of the world's biggest companies, or not, you know, maybe that is... A reality to some of them but yeah i thought that and not even follow-ups about tom and what that meant and yeah that was a, yeah just uh to kendall's point like not today like we're not dealing with that yet today so it was i'll be sending emails during a 36 hour of vanity c-section but 36 hour maternity leave vanity c-section and the kid will never i'll she'll never see me kudos for raising yet another generation of f up roy kids so that, that was going on, and her mother makes some equally biting comments that I referenced a little bit earlier. And then we get to the, as you said, the coffin comes in, they wheel it up, and Uncle Ewan, or her, the brother, gets up, James Cromwell. And Greg tries to keep him from going up, and there's a little scene, not a big one, because Ewan says, you're not going to let me give a eulogy at my brother's funeral for the for a share price and says, starts off with some, I don't want to say horrific, but very poignant stories about their childhood together. And if those are true, you can certainly see why Logan was so damaged. So he and his Logan and Ewan are sent to America during world war two to, uh, for safety. They live with an aunt and uncle. It's pretty clear. The uncle abuses Logan. I don't know if it's sexual abuse, but, at one point, we saw scars on his back in an earlier episode, so I'm pretty sure he was beaten. He's sent away to a boys' school and either complains enough to get sent home or gets sick and gets sent home. That part wasn't clear to me. But their youngest sister, who Ewan calls Baby Rose, dies of polio. And Logan somehow is convinced that he, if not contracting polio, or expressing itself, passed it to her somehow. And the aunt and uncle never disabused him of that. And those were both pretty poignant scenes. It was a pretty poignant scene about the, the boat they were traveling on too. And any real thoughts on that part of Ewan's remarks? Oh gosh, I, he was spectacular. That was a spectacular scene. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the writer's room when they had to take apart this 
episode because when you think about what they're trying, the message they're trying to say in, with each one of these eulogies, and I, it was spectacular. Like, you know, it, when you think about someone created this arc, I, we are so used to watching this and thinking, this feels so real. This seems like you're watching something in, in real time unfold. But the people who thought through this and put that backstory in for this eulogy was, I thought, spectacular. The Ewan was fantastic in how he delivered it. And then obviously, I think we're going to get to the second part of his message too, which was really also fascinating and interesting. Yeah, I thought... It was a story most people didn't know about Logan, too. I thought it was very like, humanized him, probably to everyone in that room. They wouldn't have, of course, he would never have told anyone that. And yeah, I think it also gives some insight into how that also seems to be present, like this sort of guilt and regret, certainly in Kendall's psyche. They have similar stories in some ways. Yeah, that was, it was definitely an interesting backstory of how, and, that, and it's such a, perfect again vehicle to bring that all through these sweeping eulogies it's such a perfect way to get all that information out and then he does as greg said gives a pretty hard take on his brother and really skewers him for being i I don't know if you would say he was an evil person but he certainly damaged everyone around him and i think now i now understand logan was pretty damaged and maybe that's the only way he knew to, how to act, or maybe he was getting back for how he was mistreated, but it doesn't matter. But he basically destroyed and pushed away every relationship he had, wives, ex-wives, wags, girlfriends, children, business associates, and you and made clear that's what happened. What was your take on the hard take? I thought it was perfect. I thought he was going to come even harder than that, but I think he did. I think that's why it was such a perfect scene because he knew that he still cared and loved his brother for all of his flaws and then was not going to ignore his flaws either. So I actually thought it wasn't nasty, but it was honest, if nothing else. It was a, he was mean and he made mean people meaner. And it's a really beautiful, I read somewhere in a review somewhere that had just posted like the text of the speech and it's, really profound. It's a pretty impressive piece of writing that's about fanning the flame of in people's hearts of the at the expense of others. So when you're warm, you can do these things. You can laugh at people who are in the cold. And he created or at least pushed forward that divide. And so I thought it was really incredible speech. And like I said, I think he wasn't thrown out or there wasn't a reaction really because it was true. And that it's everyone knew that also in the room knows it's true. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was great. So that leads to Roman going up and he's going li- to deliver the prime eulogy. There was some earlier talk in the episode about Connor delivering the eulogy. And I couldn't quite understand what they were saying. His text referenced, I'm not sure if it was Ayn Rand or something <laughs> else, but it was fairly philosophical and, They decided it was not appropriate. But Roman gets up there and completely breaks down. And I've seen lots of tears at funerals. And I've seen people cry when they try to do a eulogy. But I've never seen anyone completely lose it while giving a eulogy. I've seen wives or spouses or loved ones sobbing uncontrollably. But Roman just completely breaks down. And at one point, he... He points at the casket and says, get him out of there. And I thought, oh, my God, is he going to try to open it and drag his dead father's corpse out? Surely they're, <laughs> the writers aren't going to make me see that. Or is the casket going to fall open or something like young Frankenstein? It really was painful to watch. I don't know how that actor pulled that off. I don't know how many takes it took because this was not 10 seconds of crying. This was minutes and minutes of hysteria. So what were your thoughts? Um, I thought it was unbelievable acting. Unbelievable. And I do think when, like that third episode, when the guys who talk after the show give a little insight about how it was shot. I think they did something similar that they did on in the third episode when Logan died, where they left cameras, hid cameras throughout the cathedral to keep it rolling so it would be more like you're watching a play sort of more real time which i have to say there were a couple times that annoyed me there's a couple times i felt like the camera was like being like a handheld walking along it was <laughs> i was like i'm getting dizzy watching 
But yeah, but back to Roman. Again, I wonder if it had to be that overt, how big that meltdown was. He could still have totally miffed that without it being that extreme. But it still was, again, somehow so believable and so gut-wrenching. And uh, yeah, I I was like, would he really have lost it that massively? But I, I think so. I think that's what we've been conditioned to start to think, that he's this damaged, he's this... It's hard to square it a little bit with how callous he's been recently and how much he does seem like things that are emotional just are like water off a duck's back. But maybe that's the point. Maybe that's exactly what happened is he went too far in that direction and then it all came crashing down. But yeah, it was, if nothing else, it was spectacular acting. And in both Ewan's and Roman's eulogy scenes, the shots of the congregation or those in the pews was just, stunning and when i said about the facial shots with no dialogue it it was both horrific and enlightening great camera work great theater all of these actors were acting without words at a level that you rarely see it was just incredible throughout then kendall gets up says some words and saves the situation with a defense of capitalism that yeah. money pink floyd could have sang money and it would have been just as appropriate to which there's applause shiv gets up and it's not that i'm unbibbling on what she said but it didn't seem to be as focused as she normally seems yeah Any thoughts on shiv's remarks Yeah, I was a little underwhelmed by what she said. I would have thought if she'd gotten up there, and especially in this sort of impromptu manner, that she would pull something off that would have been more maybe like Kendall's. My first thought was that it seemed to me, this is my hot take though, that it seemed a little gendered. Like she talked about, she did talk about gender, to be honest. That's That was part of it, too. But it was just a little bit lighter. She's laughing, doing the sad laugh in the beginning. It doesn't seem as serious as Kendall's. And I took some issue with that because I think she was trying to be as serious and to seem as in charge as Kendall would seem. And that wasn't it. I get that she's humanizing him as well. But I, I don't know. I didn't think that one, I didn't think that added a lot. And I don't, I was sad that they, their character, their character that they wrote the character not as being a little more hard hitting than that. So after the eulogies, they go for the burial and it's not a burial because he's in a mausoleum. And I know we talk about sort of the difference between overt comedy and black comedy and understated comedy and tragedy for comedy. But I thought that was one of the greatest comic scenes in all four seasons. He bought it at a distress sale or an auction for 5 million, which Kendall believes, well, for eternity, that's pretty good value. And then they go in there and they see their places for the children to rest with him in eternity, to which I think Kendall says, I couldn't even have a drink with him. <laughs> and Connor, however, says, if I get the top bunk, maybe. <laughs> Although he's a cryo guy, which would not surprise anyone. I know. So I thought that whole scene was just hilarious. It's great. And then they get to the reception after, and that's where the real... Politic it starts. The scene with earlier on, Shiv had promised to Matson that she could get him an audience with Minkin, saying, No one will refuse a daughter on the day of her father's wedding. And the line I thought of was from The Godfather, which was, A father cannot refuse any request on the day of his daughter's wedding. That's the opening scene in The Godfather. So I just I thought that was a nice juxtaposition. But there's some circling around and someone has filmed the funeral service, including Roman's meltdown. And Frank is watching that and making some fairly rude comments to which Kendall has to ask them to stop. But it's now Roman's humiliation is now viral. But there's still business to be done. And Matson has released the India figures and it is buried as Shiv predicted. And Shiv gets him in front of Minkin with a plan or a ploy. And I'm not sure I really thought the strategy they had in place would work, but I thought Matson was masterful. 
-hmm. the way he drew that out. And he said, yeah, we're a little bit different. I'm a little bit bigger and I've got different people and other people listen to me that don't listen to you. And maybe that would be good for you. I've got the platform and, uh, and then drops the kicker that maybe I just step back. I'm the seat, the chairman of the board and we have an American director. I guess we should have said earlier, right before that, Kendall had approached Mencken and Mencken said, you're just the platform. What are you doing drilling content? And that was like, uh-oh, game over. He's just been schooled. So what were your thoughts on those two scenes? Yeah, and this is what we I think we alluded to in our previous episodes too about this regulatory stop or the regulatory bust of as the vehicle to make the deal not go through was is always a bit of a long shot, no matter what. So it's just politics in some ways. And then obviously involves the administrative state, other players. It's not just someone waving a wand and saying this deal's off. And so I always thought it was a little silly that the, all eggs were in this basket of elect Mencken and then he won't, he'll be on our side to kill this deal. And in theory, maybe that's the case, but it just seemed to me a little like, that just seems naive. That's how that works. And so I think Mencken basically said that to him. I'll think about it. And I think even Kendall's, I thought this was a done deal. This is why we're backing you. Like that, that's a bit of the quid pro quo here. And Mencken's not going to play. And so Kendall's rightfully maybe upset. And yeah, you're right. I think Mencken says something like, you're just the platform now. You want to pick the whatever the soundtrack or the whatever yeah. it is. And so I always thought that was a little bit of a risky play. Maybe equally as risky as Shiv and Matson saying, how about this? We'll make it a palatable deal for your people who are nuts about maybe foreign companies having too big of a role here or something like that. So I think they both are reading the politics, but, but yeah, the idea that you, that the president would stop a deal. So I don't know, that just to me always seems a little silly, but maybe I'm, maybe I was way off on that. So there was a scene between Tom shows up eventually and Shiv says, you never would have been late to my father's funeral when he was alive, <laughs> which I thought, I just couldn't believe she said that. And his response was, he's lost a little influence over the past couple of days, <laughs> which was a great comeback. Then Shiv's mother comes over and congratulates them. And he said, yeah, if it wasn't such a effing disaster, it'd be happy time. Tom seems to have all his defenses up here. And I don't know if he feels like he's the last man on the Titanic going down with the ship or, or he's just that hurt or maybe all of the above. So I thought that little dynamic was interesting. And then we get to the end and let me set it up and then pitch it to you for your sure. thoughts. So Roman's leaving. He tells his driver, I'm walking home. And he gets to some point where the protesters are walking down the street or being driven down the street by police Police say, look, it's not safe back there. You, sh you should go around. And he goes up to the street, the protesters on, it's barricaded off and he starts yelling F you and other pleasantries at them. Then he jumps into the street with them. And I don't know if somebody hit him intentionally or he gets knocked down, but he does. And then he gets beaten. The end scene is him on the street. I think someone was covering him up. But the police are coming and they're going to find him and rescue him. I, I guess I want to ask, was that just self-flagellation? I, I guess. I, I, what I thought was going to happen is I thought that actually the irony was going to be that the police were going to like pepper spray him thinking he was a protester or something. I thought there was going to be this sort of just in the chaos of the people who were there that he'd be seen as the other side, even though he jumped in the middle of a mob to yell at them. I read somewhere someone who'd made the comment that he couldn't get beaten up by Logan anymore. And so he just went to the closest place he could find to, to feel that again or whatever it was. This like arc of his character as needing to be beaten up or something. I, it was, I think it's a perfect icing on the cake for the breakdown. That was a massive, embarrassing breakdown that he's now viral for. Even Kendall calls him out on it a little bit, even though he's trying to be nice about it. But he's like, nope, you screwed up. He's saying that more about, I think, the idea that Mencken is going to back out of their deal. But, but yeah, I think it's a broader point of, like, he screwed up. You couldn't land any plane here today. I think he's just at his wit's end and wanted to just emote or whatever he was doing. I don't know why he would ever jump into a middle of a protest and scream at the protesters that they're idiots. Yeah, that was a shock. That was a shock. 
Well, let me show, tell you my where my warped lawyer mind went. Wow, his ex-wife's got some great evidence now when he brings an action to try to get custody for taking the kids upstate. <laughs> so you can just say, look what happened to your brother. Really- that that was, I don't I hate to use the word impressive, but acting wise, that was the most incredible series of steps in a breakdown I think I've ever seen on television. I know I've seen other others maybe over a longer period of time, but mm. compressed as we were into one television episode, I just thought that was incredible acting by Roman and he, he needs to be sent away for much more than 28 days <laughs> in a very padded bed with probably some restraints and a little medicine to calm him down to start with. He is completely broken. Yeah, I think that's uh, right. I'm not sure who's left standing. I know. Uh, I think Shiv, she's, she bet on her horse. If they yeah. don't come in, she's out. I just thought those opening scenes with Kendall, with Jess and his ex, I think Kendall's ne- up next for something. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's drugs, alcohol, or just something else. Jerry doesn't have more than maybe two or three lines in this whole one, but she of course looks great <laughs> and she and the boys are hanging out and I'm wondering is something going on there, but next week is it hour and a half episode. It was pretty special. I thought. Yeah, it was great. And then it's the last one next. What are we going to yeah. do? next? <laughs> People have been emailing me. What am I going to do next week? <laughs> so. Well, look, for all our listeners, have a great Memorial Day, Karen, and I look forward to visiting with you next week. Of course, me too. See you then, Tom.